This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meherod. Today we'll talk to Al Hetso, who is the product architect and co-founder of Bancor. Bancor has done one of the most successful ICOs this year in the cryptocurrency space, raising around $150 million. We'll talk about community currencies and how their protocol can, can lead into a world of smart tokens that don't need conventional exchanges to derive liquidity. Al, welcome to the show. Hi. So before we get down into bank, or tell us a bit about your uh, your work history. What what have you done previous before you entered the blockchain space? I'm old. I was born in '74, so you do the math. And I was seven when I started programming on computers. It was like a hobby. Uh, had a lot of fun with it. Started to sell some software when I was 16, and then joined. Uh, a unit in the Israeli intelligence, in the Israeli military. And I've been there for four years. Uh, by the end of the four years, uh, I was like an administrator of like a thousand computer network. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the one that needs to solve all the problems with no internet. <laughs> so that was a, a, a really good school, four years of school as a programmer and as a team leader in, in a you know, computer network, transitioning to Windows and transitioning to uh, SQL servers and, uh, and TCP IP. Um, I then joined a startup uh, that was sold to Cisco after 18 months, uh, Class Data Systems. And then after ICQ was sold to AOL for $400 million in cash, you know, uh, everyone, it was an Israeli company and everyone in Israel were like, thinking about starting their own internet company. So I started a company called contact.com, which was a social network. There was no web apps, so that was a downloadable app that would connect to your Outlook and Palm Pilot, if you remember that. And, uh, and it was just uh, connecting to all your friends and sharing your information with your friends and status, but that was an actual app for, for Windows. And then, uh, you know, it was a hot internet startup. We raised like $60 million, but then the internet crashed. On uh, April 2000, the entire market crashed. It was impossible to raise more money for internet startups. And the company just, you know, died after a while. It was uh, the end of that. And then I started uh, another company called Metacafe in Israel. And Metacafe was also an app for video sharing using peer-to-peer, -peer, like, you know, automatically sharing between people using peer-to-peer -peer transfers, like the most popular visa in the world, the, the world, the big, biggest hits. But, you know, that, that was because the bandwidth was very expensive. But then it got cheap, so we created a web, you know, web, uh, website. And we released very, like, like the same time that YouTube did, more or less, their website. And we actually grew much faster to, than YouTube's to like, you know, one or two million users per day, like 50 million users a month. That was like top 100 websites in the world. But, you know, our biggest mistake was that we, we really focused on bringing you the hit videos. It was more like um, Reddit videos or Dig videos. It was not YouTube. It was the greatest hits, the most viral. Because we didn't understand at the time that 99.9% .9 of the... Uh, traffic would be on the um, long tail of videos because you know people would see videos like the one that we're making right now people that are into uh, blockchain would spend much more time with this kind of niche content there's a small group of those people but 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 you know as much uh, uh, you know as as, as more uh, niche it, it is the more passionate people are about it like a soccer team or something like that and and we didn't we didn't figure that out the whole long tail thing and when I then uh, after Metacafe 
you know, uh, it was sold. Eventually, I came back to Israel, and and eventually, you know, I started to use videos on myself and finding up about Bitcoin because I was watching a podcast in 2011. And when I saw Bitcoin, I got excited because very different reasons. So first of all, because I was watching alternative media, I heard about all this, you know, uh, Federal Reserve, Jekyll Island, you know, kind of stories of how money is created and how central bank works. So I had that background before I learned about Bitcoin. And I also had a background about decentralized system and, and file sharing, a decentralized system in file sharing and how it's really hard to kind of deal with those kind of system. I mean, they're unstoppable in their nature. And, and, and with that background, when I found out about Bit Bitcoin, I saw the first successful user-generated currency. And, and for me, that was like the big aha. There is a currency which is traded all around the world that someone, no one even knows who is, made. This is like someone making a video all around the world that no one knows who is. This is possible only in the world of YouTube. It is not possible in the world of, 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 of TV. Uh, it is the ability for user-generated anything, whether it's user-generated blogs or user-generated videos or, or user-generated currencies or user-generated discussion groups like Facebook groups. And, uh, the, all those things create long tails because you have those people that can, you know, um, create the content, content themselves. It's like Wikipedia in that sense. Uh, the, there's a long tail of users that will do that and, and when it's easy to create a currency and that's the big revolution of, of blockchain. It made it possible to issue a currency for very low cost. That's, that's an instrument that, that, that was not possible. It was not possible to, to issue a currency at a very low cost until very, very recently. Uh, you know, banks could do that. Before that, royalties did that with coinage. But, but blockchain is like the YouTube of money in that sense. It brings this ability to everyone. And that was what I got excited about. But, you know, Bitcoin was one, just one single currency. So the first company that, you know, I started with, with some, some, some other people was called AppCoin. And what we did there... It's just our own platform for multiple currencies that have their own integrated marketplaces. And we deployed those currencies in different communities. And like the first communities that we, we, we tried on, it was an Israeli moms community with like 30,000 moms, young moms in Israel. And we gave them this, this digital currency and, and a wallet. And the digital currency was like kind of mentally pegged to the shekel. You could not exchange it for the local currency, the shekel, but it was mentally pegged for that. And, and you would get this currency when you sign up, you'll get a little bit, it will be issued when you, you know, kind of publish something that you're selling for the currency, when you bring a friend to the system. This is like an event that where, where the currency is issued. And that grew so fast. Like all the community like of, 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 of mom used it. And we got to a situation where we have a thousand transaction per day in the system for moms buying products and services from each other using their own currency. And we thought to ourselves, so, so, so there's something here. I mean, here we just gave them this tool, this monetary tool, this monetary technology, and they did amazing things. But over a long period of time, so I'm talking about a year or so, we saw that there is a problem um, uh, with, with liquidity. Uh, not just liquidity between the currencies, I mean, that's nice and everything, but more about liquidity to the rest of the world, to the real world, because as the community matures, it requires that, that liquidity. And that liquidity could not be achieved for small currencies, because in order to have liquidity, there's a barrier to liquidity in the world today. And liquidity is very important because... I mean, if, if, if you think about every currency as like a network of value transfer, which is like a, like, like a local network, liquidity is the internet. This is kind of the lines that connects between those networks, making like one big giant financial network uh, across the globe. And, and, and liquidity is like the, the connective tissue. And and there is a barrier to liquidity because if you are a small currency or a small scale asset, 
you're not going to attract for-profit market makers in order to create the liquidity that will allow people to buy your asset or sell your asset when they want to without affecting the price too much. I mean, how do you measure liquidity? How much do you affect the price when you sell uh, or buy uh, some percent of the supply, right? I mean, there's a way to measure it. And, 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 and that was kind of the problem we identified. And when we saw years later, I mean, we, we were like, we didn't have a solution and we winded up AppCoin. And then, then when we saw Ethereum, we, we, we figured out that something else like, you know, is, is possible. We didn't figure out what exactly, but it, there's like, that was a feeling that there's something there. And, and, and as we started working on Ethereum, we started to kind of think in that way. And I think this is a very important thing that people that do not build stuff on Ethereum, they do not think that way. It's like you've never been, you know, you never build a web app. So you only know how to build like desktop software. So you, you, you don't, you're not even thinking like browser, JavaScript. I mean, you don't think this way. You don't. And, and, and Ethereum is even more extreme because you're kind of writing models to some other computer that you cannot change. You know? uh, the, the whole idea is that, that, that this, this, uh, this global computer acts like a trustee that you give a contract to. And after you gave the trustee a contract and you pay him the fee and say, you know, do what the contract says, you cannot ask the trustee to change the contract. I mean, you can also only act within what the contract says. And so it's a whole state of mind. And, and then we understood that maybe Ethereum could be the basis for the solution of the liquidity problem that we discovered. And the solution was the Banco Protocol. Um, which basically, you know, in the most simple sense, solves the liquidity problem and removes completely the liquidity risk, makes liquidity something that you just adjust. You, you, you choose what level of liquidity you want, and you're always going to have that level of liquidity as, as the liquidity is, 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 is expressed. And uh, in, in, when, when, you, when you have that solution, then... Uh, you don't need to have market makers coming uh, to your market and, and providing that. You have that on your own within your token. And the way that it works is by maintaining reserves of other tokens. Those reserves can be compared to the order books in exchange, to the market depth. And whenever you want to buy a token, you just, you know, you, you, you can pay with a reserve and get the token or return the token and get the reserve back. And when you, whenever you do that, the price changes. And, and then it's kind of six e equilibrium over time. And the nice thing, it works to, together with existing exchanges uh, through arbitrage. So the prices are always kind of uh, adjusted and, uh, to, to the real world exchanges. And if you look at, uh, at BNT, the currency that Bancor has created, it is completely aligned and synced with all the other exchanges through arbitrage. So people can buy the currency or sell it through the contract. They can buy the token, sell it through the contract with Ether, but they can also do that in uh, exchanges. We've already started talking about Bancor a little bit now, and we want to dive deeper into how exactly Bancor works so people understand that. But maybe to, to introduce Bancor, one of these terms that you guys have used a lot, or, or one of these problems is this double coincidence of wands, which I think is quite an important term to kind of understand what Bancor is about. So can you just explain to us what is that and why is it, where do we see this problem in the world? So, you know, it's very, uh, it's, it's a very ancient concept uh, and it's a, it's a very simple one. It, it what's money solves for butter. I mean, you know, with butter, you have a problem of double coincidence of wants because I need to have what you want and you need me to have what you want. And, and, and we, need, we have this double coincidence that meets in, in, in a certain times, certain place, and then a transaction can be made. But that is a rare event because it needs to kind of match between us. And money kind of solve that problem because I can, you know, 
sell what I have for money to anyone at any time, and then I can get what I want for money from someone else at some other time. So money is like the technology that solves the double coincidence of, of wants for barter, for exchanging stuff, uh, this intermediary. Uh, you can think about writing as the technology that solves that for human communication. So before writing, there was talking, but then it needed the double coincidence of wants of me kind of talking, you listening, and you know we are in the same place at the same time doing that. But writing has enabled us essentially to talk to the paper and you know listen to the paper at different times different places and 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 solve the double coincidence of one at that domain but we still have that problem with the asset exchange because whenever you go to an exchange you need to be matched with someone with exactly opposite ones that from you and this is like the orders the, the you know the market makers and the market takers the order book and you know and, and the incoming order and, and 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 the matching that is taking place that through that you 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 have the ability to to convert one currency to to another but this ability to convert require labor it requires those market makers okay that are for profit to be there and to work like you know like a, a car requires a driver but you can have a driverless car. So, you, so, so if you have technology that can replace that labor, and that technology is a, is a smarter, more advanced token. Uh, but that's kind of the way that Banco addresses the double coincidence of wants in asset exchange by not requiring to match a buyer and a seller through a technology that calls smart tokens. That is an extremely important point. Like you, we are saving on the human labor of market makers uh, using an automated system in in, in some form. But we, uh, so one other concept that uh, I find I find like in your in your writing in your speaking that is uh, is worth fleshing out before jumping into bank or is that at at bank or like you are espousing this view. Even through your startup app coin of uh, of the bank, or you are kind of espousing this view that there is going to be a long tail of currencies, right? So, so like you said, like with your startup Meta Cafe, you realize that there is like a long tail of videos, which means like if you plot as a graph, the most popular video it might have three billion views, the next most popular two billion, and then if you plot graphs, something like Epicenter might have just five thousand views on an episode. And there might be videos with like 500 views. So the things that are million views and lower are sort of the long tail. There are enormous numbers of them with like very small number of views. And in your talks, you say that like these small videos with like very small number of views, but very large numbers of them. So you multiply a very large number of videos, multiply a very small views. That total views is much bigger than the views that uh, the very large videos with very large views generate in aggregate, right? So most of the views are actually like videos with very less views, but huge numbers of them. And like you are also taking this concept and you are sort of postulating that in the future this is going to be true of cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies, right? Tell us about this is long tail and why you think the long tail of cryptocurrency is going to be. I've been watching many phenomena of the long tail in, in the internet, which is the age of transfer of information, which is different than what we're experiencing now, which is the age of transfer of value on, 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 on the internet. But, but here, uh, in the age, you know, previously in the age of information, the long tail was apparent in videos, but not just in videos, but also very much in blogs, in podcasts. In, in discussion groups, um, subreddits. I mean, there is such a long tail phenomena de developing in so many different spaces uh, online. And the, the reason uh, that it happens in many of those cases is because there are three-tier ecosystems. Now, three-tier ecosystem is a concept that we've been kind of evolving in, in the recent years when we see 
platforms that have you know a, a specific platform and then a specific class of super users that those super users they create spaces and have like privileges on spaces that end user come to so many of those systems like like reddit you know you can create your own subreddit and you moderate your subreddit and other users they're coming for your subreddit more than they come for reddit uh, facebook groups is another example uh, Wikipedia is another example. You have a whole class of admins in Wikipedia that have more permissions to kind of manage the spaces where others interact. Um, and if you think about it, ICOs is an example. Because every ICO is the token generator, like the foundation, if you will, that kind of create uh, this token. And all the users of those of that token. So we already see token-based businesses happening around us. And if we're just talking about this use case of token-based token tokens for businesses, um, we can take just that concept to a very very long tail because there's a very long tail of businesses in the world. I mean, what is, what is a business that can benefit from a token? Maybe it can be even a small coffee shop that has like a small loyalty point. And, and, you know, many of them do have loyalty programs and they can do that using a currency. Uh, and, and, and that currency can be liquid if, if you want because, because you don't have now a barrier to liquidity. You have, you know, automated, you know, continuous liquidity that is as good as you want it to be um so so this is an example where we see a you know just, just here a long tail created uh and and i think that this is just you know tapping very small part of the potential because because there's there's so much more areas of businesses that have not gone into uh, the crypto space most of the activity we see are you know, teams building technology uh, for for blockchains. This is um, and 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 I think that already there we are seeing the use of currency. I mean, that's the killer app of Ethereum. Think about it, what people are using Ethereum to as a user generated currency platform. This is what this is like the killer app. There's no other. I I mean, Ines is nice, you know, but but you know the the killer app the what what now gives ethereum the prices that he he he's, he's seeing i think is is that that there is an ecosystem of developers and some of them big shot developers many of them like in in your show that's just making the jump and building stuff on ethereum developer adoption is by far the most important measurement of any plat platform it's the the most important kpi by far by far and that's what ethereum has and, and, and it has that around creating token for the most part at this, at this point. So we're, I, I, th I think we're seeing it forming. And, and you know, I've been in, in this kind of long tail of currencies vision for a long time. But, but you know, it, it, it took a long time for, for, for that to, to start happening. And I think it will see it more and more. So, I mean, like one of the key differences between like videos, right? And, and currencies. So even in like blockchain assets, you should differentiate between like currencies and things like shares of a business issued on a blockchain. Now, right now we're talking just about currencies, not like shares. One of the key differences I feel in between like videos and currencies is that a video doesn't have a network effect. A video doesn't become more useful because other people are viewing that same video the same time I am. But a currency has a network effect, right? Like my currency becomes, my Bitcoin become more useful the more other people use Bitcoin. So does that learning really, does that learning from the video world or the podcast world really translate into the cryptocurrency world neatly because of this feature of network effect? So we can take that learning from a very successful site and concept in general, which is discussion groups. And the very, very successful site is Reddit, where we have a long tail of subreddit, the user-generated subreddit. And each of them does have a network effect 
benefiting from having more users. So you have more content and more curation, and more feedback. So, you know, uh, it's very hard actually to lift the subreddit to be active uh, from, from the ground. So you have the network effect for any specific community, but still you have the long tail of communities. And, and if you think about concurrencies in this way, and I think that, you know, this, there is this very basic tool that is, I would call it store of value, I, I, assets. I don't know which name to give it, but that tool, that very, let's call it token, you know, but that tool can be applied to very different use cases that are very similar in nature, whether it's currency, whether it's loyalty point, whether it's shares, whether it's bonds, whether it's derivatives, whether it's asset tokenization that represents something in the other world, they all share the same property, which I can take some of it and send it to you. And then you can decide to take some of it and send it to someone else. And maybe they have some special rights and maybe you'll have a, get a dividend in email and maybe not. It doesn't matter. It's, it is the very basic same tool. So, you know, whenever I talk about currencies, I'm saying, you know, there are many, many uses. I mean, the first successful use is actually something that no one has imagined, which enabled funding and building ecosystems. I mean, today, before, before blockchain, you can only fund and build uh, um, profit centers. But to fund and build an ecosystem that does not have a single profit center, that has multiple, and, and you know, the foundation itself is, is non-profit, but there's a, like multiple profit center in, 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 in an ecosystem, this is something you couldn't do before you had this invention of ICO. And the most successful ICO ever, Ethereum, is exactly that model. They created an ecosystem. They are a nonprofit foundation. They created an ecosystem. By the way, it doesn't mean that the Ethereum creators, they do not profit personally. They did, so I've heard. But it is, it is still a nonprofit entity which is being created that is all sole responsibility is kind of develop the ecosystem of Ethereum. And it worked. Here's an ecosystem. It's happening. A lot of resources are being diverted to that ecosystem. And this is what a currency, a token, enables you to do. Golem is an ecosystem of software developers, of service providers, of service consumers. If you look at every ICO, I mean, most of them, not, not all of them, some of them are actually for-profit businesses, which makes sense because, again, an ecosystem is made of for-profit players that are all centralized, if you will. But the ecosystem is decentralized, and there are many for profit. And, and, and because, it, you know, when Facebook and, and Microsoft tried to create ecosystem around their companies, they always failed eventually because you have a profit center in the middle, like Apple or, you know, those companies. And you always like competing with your ecosystem for the margins. So if someone is like too successful in the ecosystem, you acquire them or you're like, uh, you know, building a competitive service. But it's not a good idea to have an ecosystem around a for-profit model. So the, 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 the kind of historical model of companies, of, of shares, is, is, is just not suitable for ecosystem. We found out. But here's a model that works, works well, and is successful, at least in one and may, perhaps in many more. So this is a kind of example of how people can use the ability to issue their own currency. It's pretty incredible in my eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited about watching this unfold. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, fully, I fully agree. And I think the, the network effects that you get from, from tokens, from ICOs, is just incredible. Uh, and they are so powerful, especially in, in the startup phase of, of having any project. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets 
directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. Let's now talk about Bancor, uh, kind of in detail how Bancor works. So uh, in particular, right, there is this possibility that you, you create a new token, which you guys have called a smart token often, that, that kind of leverages Bancor uh, and that basically has a reserve of another uh, a token that kind of serves this liquidity and price price stabilizing function. So, so let's let's uh, maybe we can run briefly through the example of of a project that says, okay, uh, we want to create uh, an Ethereum token, uh, and and we want to use the Bancor protocol to make this a, a more powerful and better token. So, can you explain how would that work, and and how would Bancor in, in this context work and interact with this token, uh, and what are uh, the benefits of that? So, Bancor essentially function as a built-in non-profit automated market maker for the token. So it has some capital of another token and with this capital it works as this market maker and it works as market maker because at any point he's willing to buy the token from you or sell the token to you in a specific price. But as you buy or sell the token, the price changes. And the price changes is based on how much you bought or sold the token. By the way, it doesn't matter in hand how many transactions, just how much you, you, you bought in general or, or sold in general. That, that affects the price. And there's no spread, essentially. There is a, there is a slippage, which is as you have a you know, larger transaction then your price is increasingly worse, but there's no spread between the buy and sell price. And, and, and this is, um, this is what, what a smart token does. It's being its own market maker. So why would anyone want that? So the first thing is that you don't need to be listed in an exchange in order to be liquid to other currencies. I mean, this is just a, you know, a, a very straightforward advantage. You're always liquid. If someone has... Uh, ETH, Ether, and wants to buy your token, can do it right now just by sending the Ether to an address. Someone has your token and want to liquidate it back to, to ETH, can do it through the Ethereum network at any given time, any given moment. So that's a good service for your token hold that you know many people will want. And um, the other thing is that it provides some kind of a stabilizing effect on the token because again there's this non-profit market maker in the middle that says you know i'll buy from you i'll sell from you um uh, and 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 it it uses this very simple concept that the price in which the the market maker the automated market maker would buy and sell from you is just going to be the price that maintain that the reserve has a specific ratio to the market cap of the token so if you you can define a reserve to be five percent it that means that there would be exactly five percent of another token in your reserve uh, compared to the market cap of your token and then mar automated make market maker will just make sure that this remain the case by using very simple formulas uh, that that are kind of taking taking care of that it's path independent. Again, doesn't matter uh, if you split your transaction into ten. You're always going to get the best price, the, the same price. You're always going to uh, end up in the same way. And this price is is kind of equalized with the market through arbitrage. So, so if the your token is actually also traded on some exchanges, which uh, you know have their own users and their own integration to other tokens, and um, then. You know, you obviously uh, you can trade in both places, which is very common in this world where the token is traded in many, many pairs, many, many exchanges in parallel. And arbitrage is kind of balancing the price between the places. So there's just another place that arbitrage does that, does that. And if you go to Coin Market Cap, you can see in Bancor one of the markets is the smart contract. So it's in the list of the markets that trade BNT to Ether. 
let's run through this example now. So let's say we are creating Epicenter coin and we want to use Bancor. Uh, and, and so, so you set a, a reserve ratio, right? Which we say, okay, you know, uh, there's a certain, there's a small contract which manages this epicenter token. Uh, and now, let's say we want to s say that per ether that's in this contract, we're gonna, uh, you know, kind of allow one thousand, or we want a, a backing of one ether per one thousand epicenter token. So that then means that somebody wants to get an epicenter token they can basically send an ether there and then the smart contract sends to them uh 1000 um yeah. epicenter coin and the same thing somebody has some epicenter coin they want to get rid of them you, you send that person sends this epicenter coin to the smart contract uh the, the smart contract pays out the ether and then destroys those epicenter coins so that is yeah. again kind of this you have to say equilibrium where you know the reserve goes up the token supply goes up, reserve goes down, token supply goes down, but you have kind of the same backing ratio at all times. Does that roughly? Uh, yeah, accurate? I mean it's it's accurate. It, it is accurate. We just you know we we are careful of using the word backing because backing kind of means that the token does not have a utility that is worth something because it's back. And some tokens are like that. Like Tether is a token that is worth something because it is backed by dollars. And it makes sense for that. And and uh, Maker is going to be a stable coin backed by Ether, perhaps. So so those scenarios are, are are great. But this is less about backing. This is about providing a liquidity pool, like again the market depth of of a market that that gives you kind of the leeway in order to convert one to another. So it's more like a liquidity pool and less like as something that gives value to the token it only gives liquidity to the token you know if you're liquid but no one wants you it doesn't going to help you your price is going to crash so we have this example of the epicenter coin but let's say we want to incentivize people to to put money in that we want to do an ico uh, and, and we want to have some kind of linkage so that if the project becomes really successful the coin is going to go up in value how can you combine that with Bancor? Because if you have this fixed ratio of, you know, one Ether, 1,000 epicenter coin, so it's, can, it's not, can, it's you, not can you have both? Yeah, so, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how, let's say that um, the, the um, uh, epicenter coin has a reserve in Ether and it has a 5% reserve, just for, for the sake of example. Now, you can, you know, issue that currency and, and you know, sell it to everyone that want to be, um, you know, promoting his products and sponsorship on Epicenter. And you tell everyone that you will be giving sponsorship exclusively for that currency. So if you want to get to our show, you better get a hold of that currency. And you can do all kind of neat tricks like saying, and whenever someone pays you, us with this coin, we burn half of the payment. In the smart contract, you know, it just burns. The, 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 that, the, uh, so, so it's like a deflationary. You can do all kind of stuff, but, but that is your token and people hold your token. And if people want sponsorship from you, then they'll have to spend that token and they will have to acquire that token. And that will create the demand for the token. Now, uh, that, you know, that alone is something that is enough to generate some demand for a token because there is a demand for sponsorship on Epicenter. That's just one example. Now, in, in this case, what the Banco protocol will do is just make sure that doesn't matter how many people use that token, maybe it's just 100, it is always liquid. You can always buy it, you can always sell it. But when you buy it and sell it, the price changes. So if, if the token costs $1 right now and I bought a lot of it, maybe by the end of that purchase, it was $1.2. And if I buy a lot more, it will be worth $1.4. And and this is how it works, just like in exchanges, just like in the in in the bid ask model, but in a more predictable way, a more predictable fashion, if you will. Maybe one question that would be useful to clarify. So when you say there's a five percent reserve ratio, like what does that mean? Does that mean you would have five ether for one thousand epicenter coin, 
Or does that mean the value of the ether would roughly correspond to 5% of the value of all the epicenter? Yes, so the, the ratio is between uh, value and when you have a reserve in ether, then your token is denominated in ether. The price is denominated in ether for the sake of that particular reserve. Again, you can have multiple reserves with different currencies, then you will have a price denominated in those other tokens uh, or currencies. But if you have a reserve in Ether, your price is denominated in that reserve and, and in, in, in Ether, and, and then your market cap is the price times you know, the, the supply, right? This is how you could calculate that. So the ratio should be between your reserve balance and your market cap, and it is always maintained on five, Five percent. So if I have a thousand tokens and each one, the current price is one ether. So my market cap is a one thousand ether. And if I have five percent uh, reserve ratio, it means that I will have fifty ether in my reserve. That that what it mean. When we are creating epicenter coin, or somebody is creating like one of these smart tokens. We have a choice of like setting the reserve ratio to be like 5%, 10%, 20%, or 30%. What advantage do we get if the reserve ratio is higher? What disadvantage do we run into if, this, if it's smaller? It's adjustable. You can, you, you can adjust it. I mean, you can even create a smart token where you set a, 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 like a, a, some kind of... A, Minimum and maximum reserve that uh, you know so you, the community can vote anywhere between. So you can you can do these kind of things. You, the way you change it is that you slowly change it over time. So it has like very minimal uh, effects on, on on the current price. But uh, having more reserve is uh, re having higher CRR, having higher percentage, is essentially having higher liquidity, which is not always good. Because the ultimate liquidity is pegging. It's just one-to-one. -one. You never affect the price in any way when you're buying and selling. Uh, and, and when you have a very small reserve, let's say 0.01%, then almost every attempt to, to, to convert from the reserve token to the smart token would affect the price drastically. So you want the price to be affected when, when people are buying the token and selling the token, and you need to decide by how much. So it is really, liquidity becomes like a setting rather than um, you know, um, something that you hope to achieve from market makers. It is a setting. You can set higher liquidity or, or, or low one. So the, the way I understand that is, Let's, let's say that the total value of epicenter coin is today 10,000 Ether, right? And let's consider like two scenarios. Scenario one in which in reserves is 5%. So 5% 5 of 10,000 Ether would be what? 500 Ether, right? And scenario two is reserve is 30%. So 30% of 10,000 Ether is uh, 3,000 Ether. So epicenter coin, has a market cap of 10,000 ether. It might have a million units, each worth uh, 0.01 ether, but the market cap is 10,000 ether. And then scenario one, it's like five ether, uh, 500 ether in reserve, and scenario two is 3,000 ether in reserve. So in the difference between these two scenarios is, let's say I want to go and now get 20 ether worth of epicenter coin, which might be say 2,000 epicenter coins. So when the reserve is 5%, the price will increase. And when the reserve is 30%, the price will also increase. But in the 30% case, the price will increase less exactly. as compared to the 5% case. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and the same on the opposite side. When I'm trying to sell epicenter coins, the price will decrease in both cases. In the 5% case, it will decrease more than it will in the 30% case. And there's some kind of sensitivity to, to this, right? Like maybe there's like an optimal point where, uh, where you spend less on, where you put less, the least in reserve, but you also get less, but you also get good uh, like price. Uh, volatility. Price volatility. In some cases you want uh, stability 
And in other cases, um, it's less important because when you have when when you have more vol volatility, then the price can go up or down faster to a target price. So it's kind of uh, it 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 would uh, move faster with with the lower liquidity, and it would move slower with high liquidity markets. And that's kind of the general rule of, of how it behaves. But again, this is just making that uh, a setting and, and, and solving that through the token itself, the, the, the mechanism that, uh, which, which is, which is the, the, the reason that we, you know, the, we need to issue more token. Because if you're buying new token, you're buying the token from the token, it needs to be able to issue to you. By the way, it issues in a ratio that let's say with a 10% reserve uh, if the token doubles in value then it would issue like 10% more of the token so that would be the rate of new token issuance if it doubles in value with 10% reserve it will be around 10% of new issued token so it's not so bad in terms of it's like an up round if you will in a startup if you're familiar with the term one of the questions though here becomes that like when we say create epicenter coin, uh, when we put ether in its reserve, how exposed are we to the volatility of ether? Like, like let, let, let's say tomorrow uh, ether crashes by 50%. Uh, what would happen to epicenter coin in, in that scenario? So if, if epicenter coin is traded only through a smart contract, and only to ether, and ether completely crash. That obviously will have a big effect. But it's very important to to kind of look around and see how most token behaves. And many of the tokens are uh, traded uh, with, with different other tokens, like maybe Ethereum and Bitcoin and maybe USDD and and there's like those already standard token that many tokens traded to, and and the same goes the same works with smart contracts so you know if if you don't want to be exposed to the volatility of ether you can for example have a, a die token maker die token in your reserve or maybe some digix gold token in in your reserve and and hold some of that so you can you can create those reserves externally or internally to the token. There are like different solutions for that. But that will provide a stability that is based on several tokens and arbitrage would do the kind of balancing between them. Uh, but but it you know it would not rely on a single exchange to a single token, uh, essentially in, in in that scenario. But, but let me just clarify something. So let's say now we have, uh, you know, these 10,000 epicenter coins and we have this or 10,000 ether of epicenter coins and, and they have a certain price, right? In, in, in dollars and, and they have a certain price because there's certain like fundamental value associated with them, right? Certain amounts of ads being sold or, or viewers and projections, etc. And now we have an underlying asset that's basically, you know, 5% of the value of, of these epicenter tokens. Uh, in ether right and now you have the the ether price collapses but the fundamental let's say the fundamental value of epicenter coin is unaffected so but then the price of these epicenter coins in, in let's say dollar terms would also crash is that right uh, so so how, how is how is that dynamic yeah i i will tell you what will happen is that the price uh, in ether will uh, uh, um would would actually increase because as ether price drops to the dollar, it would create an arbitrage and makes it very cheap to buy your token for ether, and uh, relative to the price of buying your token for 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 dollars. So it would would encourage people to buy your token for cheap ethers and sell it on full price to the dollars. And essentially moving that crash and kind of balancing it with all the other markets that so it will have some effect because one market is crashing but as the market crash you know the uh, you know the the admin you know can 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 even choose to emergently like shut down this particular 
exchange between ether and 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 the token because it's just like another market it's not it's not anything you can have many of those some of them can open some of them can close it's very dynamic it's every smart token is just another market that connects between uh, multiple you know two or more different tokens and allow them to convert between them uh, so so you're free to create your own stability system uh, and 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 that would not allow your token to crash if if ether is crashing completely it would just have you know some temporary effect so in in, in other words it's like if epicenter token were sort of representing the profits of the epicenter enterprise like okay we have advertisements we make money and the epicenter and this money is di distributed to the epicenter token owners then an ether crash so like an ether might crash but our audience remains the same the money we make remains the same right so even if ether crashes the value of epicenter token the intrinsic value of epicenter token remains the same so in some way like this market will adjust that epicenter token is like if it was like 100 epicenter tokens to one ether before ether crash it would be now like 50 epicenter tokens to one ether and this would automatically be discovered um, through the smart contract itself exactly okay so so we we we, we, we get this get this thing right? it's like when you want to issue your new currency you can like link it to another another currency or basket of currencies in reserve and then um, that creates like this automated uh, liquidity or trading system. So now in this vision, where does BNT fit in? So you have this bank on network token. I think that uh, if generally it's important to understand the, kind of the scope, the context. And the context is that Bancor is a foundation that is created to, you know, to promote and, 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 and develop the Bancor protocol uh, and, and the foundation is creating an ecosystem that uses BNT as its token. Just like, again, Ethereum Foundation creates an ecosystem that uses Ether as its token. Now, the ecosystem that Banco creates is very different than, than the Ethereum because it's a liquidity network. What we're creating is not a blockchain. It's a liquidity network. Now, liquidity network is a network that you can jump from any type of token to another in minimum hops because every hop costs you more money. Every conversion costs you more money. So you want to get to the minimum hops. So as we create the liquidity network, we create it with BNT in its center. So we create, for example, we announce that we're going to create a token changer between BNT and Gnosis. So everyone can convert between them. Now, since BNT has a very large 10% Ether uh, uh, reserve, and I can explain uh, why, why that is, is, is considered a big number for, for us. But because of that, you can also exchange to Ether. So now you can exchange from Gnosis to Ether. And, and then you'll be able to exchange between Gnosis to any other token that has kind of a token changer with BNT. So BNT is like the, the, the network token of that particular liquidity network that we are building and, and, and we, we, we have funding in order to achieve its goals. So, you know, getting the liquidity, putting the initial liquidity in the token changers, you need, you need to build that. So that's, that's the goal of the foundation and, and making that protocol uh, used by 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 many can you explain so so what are the kind of um network effects around bnt or, or to what extent will there going to be a link between you know bnt and the success of the bank or protocol usage because you know for example what why not use ether as as the reserve token since you know that's uh, so much more prevalent and and, and popular. Why, why does Gnosis in this case have an advantage of using BNT? The, the idea is that when you create an ecosystem on blockchain, I think we've seen it with every ecosystem with block with with Bitcoin, with Ethereum, and and I think we'll see it with more uh, ecosystem. One of the most important properties of those ecosystem is to benefit 
the early adopters, to incentivize the early adopters. The early adopters of Bitcoin, you know, were were incentivized to use the system, and and I think I think that's any you know a very noble concept that you know if you build a product, you build a uh, uh, so you have the developers, you have the people that have contributed funds to that product, so you want to incentivize them. them. So incentivizing the early adopters to kind of you know build that network is done using that currency, and when and because that's the whole um, I think structure of building an ecosystem and funding an ecosystem. The reason that people are willing to sponsor and, and contribute to new ecosystem is because they are incentivized to do that. Because if the ecosystem is indeed successful, proven successful. And, and provide value to people, uh, you know that 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 would uh, benefit the, all those groups. So I think that everyone that joins, being the first one to join BNT, he is better to work with BNT because BNT is the not the token that everyone uses, but it's the token with the most token changers. So that we're going to build more token changes for BNT than to any other token because this is our charter, this is our goal, and and BNT having the most token changes could be exchange could be the shortest path to exchange to everything else. Now you can have an additional uh, reserve in Ether. You can have only reserve. I mean, you can do whatever you want essentially. I mean, it's just a smart contract, but but we're creating this liquidity network that makes it uh, you know just. The shortest, the, the lowest, the lowest cost to you to to convert between point N and B because you have this intermediary currency that connects the other. So it's just and just one network of of liquidity, and maybe there will be more. Like you know, there is Ethereum Classic. I mean, you can always kind of take the smart contract and create your own liquidity network, and you know maybe it would be better. But dynamics shows that it. You know, this is what people that copied the Bitcoin code originally thought. Oh, I'm just going to create my own currency. It's going to be great. But, you know, creating a liquidity network, it's, it's hard. It's a lot of work. So you can try to do that. You can make it successful. And, you know, it's, it's fine. You know, and this is the beauty of, of this industry that, you know, people can try. That, to me, seems a very ripple-esque answer, actually. So, uh, so, the, so you know this other project, right? Like Ripple, which has this token XRP, and and like the way the way like Ripple talks about XRP or sells XRP is that uh, they want to make it that exchange bridge, right? Like when you want to go from the Mexican peso to the Indian rupee on the Ripple ledger. Uh, you will go through XRP because there's a market between XRP and Indian rupee and XRP and the Mexican peso. And as long as like the market depth is very high on both sides, XRP is the best bridge currency. Yeah. They they want to position XRP as that as that bridge currency, and that is supposed to be the utility. Yeah. Now what what do you, the way I would translate like your answer to to here is like you're inventing a new exchange technology. Right, so you don't need a market maker and humans and to exchange between two pairs, but you are sort of preserving that same kind of business model, right? Like trying to be like whenever you're going from one token to another, trying to position B a B and T as that bridge, right? Like so, token one would have B and T in reserve, and token two would have B and T in reserve, so it's the shortest path. Yes. Now it could be the case that token two has ether in reserve, token one has BNT in reserve. Then BNT and ether, like BNT has ether in reserve, so that becomes like three hops. Uh -huh. If the end token is connected to BNT, it makes sense for token n plus one to also connect to BNT. Exactly. Because that would allow the users of token n plus one to easily go to the other end tokens, and the users of these first end tokens to go to token n plus one. Exactly. So. Um, so basically, you're trying to build uh, that 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 form of bridge. So, like as as like now now approaching this as an investor's perspective in BNT, right? So 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 like when I think of it as an investor in BNT, suppose I like this market hypothesis. What are the like key performance metrics or key performance indicators? 
an investor in BNT ought to look at? Like, what what must happen in the market for the investor to know this vision is going well? And what metric, if it fails, means that this vision isn't going well? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and uh, it's a very simple answer. Um, BNT, being a network currency, is a currency for currency. It's a token for tokens. It, it, we don't build it, we didn't build it in order to be used by end users. We build it to be used by other tokens as reserves. I mean, this is the whole bank or concept is that money can use money, right? So the most important metrics is how many other tokens hold BNT in reserve and what is their market cap. You can measure it, their volume. So you can really see uh, who are the members in this network, who are the other tokens. And uh, today it's only the BNT, but uh, we have you know a couple of tokens that will be launched soon uh, with their own smart token. And hopefully Gnosis is going to be one of them. And, uh, and, you know, we'll start to see some kind of network between different token through BNT. But that, that will be the measurement, the most important. See, you know, how much it's used and, and you know, how, uh, how the network grows. And uh, then the, the volume is also very important because um, uh, one of the use cases for Banco Protocol for existing tokens is something called Token Changer. And the Token Changer is, is, is essentially... A smart token with two reserves, each like 50% CRR, 50% reserve. And basically, it's a place that people, it works in the exact same manner, but you, you, you just park your, your liquidity there. Uh, whether you have Gnosis or you have BNT, you can park it there. And uh, whenever someone is doing conversion between the two, uh, some of the conversion will be kept as fee in the reserve. So the reserve will grow uh, at a specific rate, according to how many people are converting from each other, so it kind of generates profit for those who are holding this uh, smart token, this token changer smart token. So this is like a for-profit uh, structure to provide liquidity that kind of pro offer people fees in order to park their liquidity in a smart token to provide liquidity between two tokens. And, 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 and the built-in mechanism that having uh, one or two reserve is kind of the uh, non-profit uh, model that you can uh, use to use the, the banker protocol. Cool, fantastic. Uh, so we're already running pretty late and there's so much more that we want to talk about, but there, is, <laughs> there are, I think, a few things that we want to at least address. So first of all, uh, the crowd sale. So you guys did a, or a massive crowdfunding campaign, which I think it was uh, yeah just above the DAO, uh, and I think it was the the largest since I guess now there's maybe some that have surpassed it with like Tezos and EOS and stuff. But uh, I mean, of course, a any crowd sale at this point is going to be surpassed pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, so so first of all, with this crowd sale, uh, there was a lot of controversy around it. Um, one of this was that there was this cap, which is supposed to be one hour and it ended up, ended up being uh, three hours. So you guys extended it. Uh, can you guys uh, talk about this? Like what was going on there? Why did you make, make this decision? I mean, uh, what happens is that, you know, we didn't anticipate, uh, Ethereum network to not being able to handle, uh, the load for so long. We thought that, you know, within a reasonable period of time the transaction will be cleared but apparently uh, there was a you know very very high load on the network and you know we were talking to many many people that were addressing us and telling us that are not just not able to to get transaction through within uh, within the first hours and and the whole idea of the first hour is just to, to let any, anyone that try to send uh, funds in the in the in the in, in the first hours to succeed because it was about inclusiveness. Now the inclusiveness was something that was uh, you know we wanted to let anyone that wanted to participate to do so, but we didn't need all all that money. So we 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 had this cap. Uh, you know, some went to the reserve. The cap was was two hundred thousand ether. That was the cap. Which just, by the way, 30 days before the ICO was was 18 million dollars, 
uh, and the price just jumped like crazy. But that was the cap. And, 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 and anything above the cap, which ended up to be like $40 million, went to a price floor, which is like not ours. It's, 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 a, it's a just money back, you know, limited money back guarantee to all the investors in the, in the ICO price. That's what it is. And, and you know, when, when it's there, it's there and it can be run out, which, which is did. When Ether plumped from 400 to 100, like 30, it was a very rough um, drop. And, and at that point, a lot of money kind of left the crypto industry, like the crypto space. And uh, we saw, uh, you know, uh, the, this, this uh, price for flow being used. But it's just protecting the investors and, you know, keeping the kind of minimum price for much longer uh, by, by having this kind of price flow, which, which is a mechanism to accept more money than you need without taking that money, just providing that money as a service to the community. And maybe within a few years, if some of it is not used, you can take it. But, but it's a mechanism to just allow more to participate, which we like. We think it's a great... Uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing to allow anyone that wants to participate and not let them to compete about being the first transaction or put like insane gas fees or we didn't like what we saw on, on other ICOs so so this is what we did here and and people that wanted it to end after an hour you know they want I, I'm sure there were a lot of people like that because a lot of people are making a lot of money from ICOs that do not supply the initial demand so there's like the mission, initial demand of 100 million and they sell like for 30 million and then, you know, it goes to the exchanges and the price goes up and, you know, a lot of flippers and scalpers like making tons of money and, you know, returning their investment plus and keeping those tokens for free just because they were able to get in the beginning. We didn't want that. And, and people that wanted it to end within an hour were barely anyone could put a transaction in. Uh, they want to have this manufacturer scarcity and, and it's just not something we believe in. Uh, something that is done, but we, we didn't believe it. it's the best way for us. I very much agree. Uh, I think it's very important that we figure out structures where you know, people can put in money uh, and, and you know, there's, not, there's not this whole gaming element of trying to be first and trying to get in. And at the same time that you can still have a cap because it's, I think, insane to just say we take whatever money we can get. Uh, I, I think that's a very, also a very poor approach. So I, th I think it's, it's certainly an innovative uh, and interesting um, way you guys have done that. And, and you certainly succeeded also in, in getting a large number of people to put money in. I think it was over 10,000. I, I think that's more than actually there were in the Ethereum uh, crowd sale back then, uh, maybe a similar amount that was in the DAO crowd sale. I don't know if you have that a number, but I think it I was. I don't, but it was one of the one of the largest, and we were very happy about having so many. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the, I guess the the point where I'm sort of like wondering about the structure is, is is my feeling would be. I mean, I don't know how you feel about that, but do you think that if you didn't have a price floor? the price of BNT will be much lower today? It could be, but if we didn't have price floor, it means that either we had that money and maybe the market would kind of price the fact that we have that Ether and would give us a better price because of that. Or it means that we had a hard cap which means that we left a lot of demand which is unsatisfied and that would actually mean a much higher price for not having a price floor because all that demand will push up the price when it comes after the ICO. We actually satisfied $150 million of demand right at the ICO. So there was no additional de demand to push the price up, which was our intention. We didn't think that our value should change five minutes after the ICO. It's the same company. The market just priced it. Yeah, yeah I, I guess what sort of the thing that I had in mind, although maybe this is getting a little bit uh, too off track, would be like, let's say you, you return the money above the cap. Maybe one says you return it three months later, so there's some, some cost of putting it in. Uh, you then may still see... But yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure that would be any better than what you guys have done. So I, I certainly... 
uh, I certainly think it is from that perspective, even though I, I didn't study it that closely, I think it's a reasonable design that you guys chose for the crowd sale. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to try new things in this uh, space and see what works and what's not. And be ready to, you know, I think that the price flow was, was, was a great thing. And, and if we would have thought about it before, we would not have any one hour limit. I mean, we probably would keep it up for a week. But we didn't think about price flow initially. We we kind of uh, we created that because initially the, the 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 community was like complaining that we'll have too much, uh, you know, money under our control. We didn't think that we'll get so much in the in the sale. But because they said it, we offered that price flow to give that assurance that we don't want too much money. We're gonna have like a price flow. But that was a good idea. Maybe the one hour was not such a good idea. But it's it's. Stuff you learn if, if you try. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ayal, I think we are kind of at the end of our episode. There's been uh, lots, lots of interesting stuff to talk about. I, I think Bancor is going to be a, a topic that hopefully we'll come back to, right? Hopefully we'll, we'll see some interesting projects using Bancor uh, going to market. And I think some incredibly interesting things could be built when we have these liquidity networks. I certainly uh, agree that it's a very interesting direction uh, and yeah I think a lot, probably a lot of listeners will still have uh, open questions it's not an easy concept to understand Bancor, uh, it's not a very intuitive concept to understand but of course we'll, we'll link to uh, the white paper, we'll link to some of the other uh, writings you guys have done which is, includes some very nice writings I was particularly impressed also with your post uh, which was a you know, response to Amy Gunsira's criticisms of you which was a uh, half a book chapter that you wrote, but uh, I think quite, quite well addressed uh, a lot of the, the points he had. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much for coming on and, and for yeah, sharing about the super interesting project you're working on. Thank you for having me. Okay, and well, thanks so much for listener once again tuning in. Of course, as I mentioned, we'll have uh, a whole bunch of links to talks and other resources about bank course. If you want to learn more, you can, you can go there. And, uh, and yeah, Epicenter is part of Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find this show and our shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And if you want to support the show, you can do so by leaving an iTunes review for us. Unfortunately, there is no Epicenter coin you can purchase, but uh, a review you can leave. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.